Pet shop boys wondering, what are we going to do about the rich? Well, that's just one song among scores of songs which take the wealthy and the privileged as their target. A new book called The Rich in Public Opinion labels this readiness to indict the rich as upper classism, the prejudice and discrimination that is practised against those who are perceived to be, well, upper class. For while it may be true that people often admire the wealthy, the evidence in this book shows that many people also envy them, sometimes with the sort of toxic envy that can put their lives at risk. So what is the extent of this hostile attitude towards wealth and the wealthy? Well, the author of The Rich in Public Opinion has sought the answer through extensive polling in four industrialised Western countries, Germany, the United States, France and Great Britain. And the results of this international polling? Well, time to bring in the author himself. He's historian and sociologist Rainer Zeitelmann. Uh, Rainer, welcome to the programme. The richest victims of prejudice seem rather an unlikely subject of study to the extent they are, well, in so many ways, a hugely advantaged minority compared to the majority of the population. But you suggest that history, well, it complicates that view. In what ways does it complicate it? Of course, you're right. Rich people live comfortable lives, and that's why so many people want to become rich. But please don't forget that again and again throughout history, rich people have also been victims. Please remember, they have been driven from their homes and countries and even murdered. The 20th century is full of examples. Think of the Chinese Cultural Revolution. Think uh, about the Khmer Rouge uh, terror in Cambodia. We should not forget Words can quickly become deeds. In Germany, where I'm living, terrorists uh, from the so-called Red Army faction murdered CEOs of German banks. And we have this even now in the corona crisis. In Germany, we had a lot of protesters with uh, posters against Bill Gates, for example, with conspiracy theories that uh, Bill Gates uh, caused the corona crisis. Uh, what, what's absolutely nonsense. We had it in the 20th century as well in Germany. You know that uh, Jewish people were, were scapegoats when we had uh, economic uh, crisis at the end of the 20th. You had this always in history in situation of crisis that uh, minorities, not only rich people, were scapegoats. Let's now move on to your study. You commissioned the world's first international comparative study into prejudices and stereotypes against the rich. And you're looking at four countries, four industrialised countries, the United States, United Kingdom, France and Germany. One of the things that you did with these interviewees was to give them a list of various minorities, Muslims, immigrants, Jews, black people, gay people, disabled people, people receiving welfare benefits, unemployed people, and people who are rich. Uh, Now, which of these groups, the respondents were asked, do you need to be careful not to criticise in public? We asked this question to find out whether the respondents felt comfortable expressing their opinions about the rich. Usually we have a, a problem when we study attitudes towards minority groups because in a lot of cases people feel not comfortable to, to criticise minorities because any criticism is seen as socially undesirable. But this is not the case with the rich. In, in all four countries, people think that you have to be careful, for example, to criticise Muslims or uh, black people. 60, 70 percent or more of the interviewers uh, said that you have to be careful uh, to say negative things about these minorities. But not when you speak negatively about the rich. And then you talk about discovering a link between people who subscribe to zero-sum beliefs and social envy. What do you mean by that exactly? Zero-sum thinkers, they believe that the rich only become rich because they have taken something from the poor. But we presented to the interviewers the following statement. I think it would be fair to increase taxes substantially for millionaires even if I would not benefit from it personally. So what I mean, social envious are not primarily motivated by the desire to improve their own situation, to close the gap between themselves and the rich. They are much more concerned with making the life worse for Uh, rich people. Is it possible for you to say what it is about these countries that you studied that led 
to the differences in their attitudes towards the rich. I think these are uh, cultural traditions. We find the highest levels of social envy in France, followed by Germany, where I live. Envy is lower in the United States and UK. Uh, attitudes towards the state and the government play a uh, a major role, I would suspect. For example, French people, I think they love the state. They are strong believers in the state and Americans have traditionally been rather critical of what they call big government. Uh, you know, they are critical against uh, high taxes and pro-capitalists. At least this is true for the old Americans. As mentioned, for young Americans, this is not uh, any more true. What, one other variable I just want to ask you about was, was age. Uh, you found this was a significant factor, wasn't it, in terms of differences in attitudes towards the rich? Among our most striking findings was that young people under the age of 30 in the United States have a very critical attitude towards the rich. In contrast, older Americans, I mean, over the age of 60, my age, they see the rich in a very positive light. And now, interestingly, the opposite is true in Europe. In, in France, Germany and Great Britain, the differences between young and old are not so large. You wanted to talk to people who knew at least one millionaire personally. When we asked the population as a whole, which, if any of the following, are most likely to apply to rich people, people in Germany answered 62% self-centered, 56% materialistic, 50% ruthless, 49% greedy, 43% arrogant. And then we did something we asked in a next step only those respondents who said they know at least one millionaire, and we asked them the same question about the millionaire they know. And the answers were now 71% industrious, 71% intelligent, 58% imaginative. We know it from prejudice research that sometimes if people, they have only their fantasies that the answers about these uh, people and about their personality traits are quite different from those people who know them well. And you'd want to say, wouldn't you, that this personal experience of millionaires by some people stands in contrast to, if you like, the prejudices, the beliefs, the stereotypes which are held by those who only come into contact with representatives Representations of the rich in the media. I mean, you looked at yes. the stereotypes of the rich in, I think, 560 Hollywood movies, and tell me what you found. This included uh, movies like, uh, I think, you know, Wall Street or Titanic or Pretty Woman. I think everyone knows this movie with Richard Gere and Julia Roberts. And we compared how rich characters were portrayed in these movies with the non-rich counterpart. And the, the rich were mostly described as intelligent on the one hand, that's true, but morally bad on the other hand. And the non-rich were portrayed much more positively. Your study was published by the Cato Institute. I mean, this is a think tank originally founded as the Charles Koch Foundation. It describes itself as dedicated to the principles of individual liberty, limited government, free markets and peace. Some readers of your book might suggest that the nature of the publisher suggests a particular bias in favour of the wealthy, in favour of the rich, and that may have shaped your study. Is that fair, or how would you combat that suggestion? Cato is a libertarian think tank, that's true. But the survey wasn't conducted by Cato. Uh, it was conducted by the very renowned uh, institute Ipsos Mori. I think you know them. And it is true that I'm sometimes accused of being a defender of the rich. But even if that were so, why would that be wrong? In any court case, you need both a prosecutor and a defense, and no judge can find the truth if there are only accusers, and even murder is allowed to have a lawyer. <laughs> uh, but but uh, the rich uh, do not have many friends, especially in sociology. You wanted to say that prejudice against the rich not only uh, harm the rich, but they do serious damage to society as a whole. They, they simplify our understanding of crisis and negative events. Just expand on that finally for me. If you don't understand the real causes of a crisis, then you 
can't do nothing against this crisis. We have seen this in the financial crisis. The financial crisis is very complicated. More than 99.9% of people had a very uh, simple answer when you ask them about the reasons of the crisis. It was, for example, the, the greedy banker. You know, you have this uh, demonstrations as well in, in London. I remember that they hanged a banker, not a real banker, but a puppet of a, uh, of a banker. The other thing is, I, I heard this uh, interview before that you had with this idea of higher wealth taxes for millionaires. You're, sure, you can do all this, but this is what I don't understand with some people in UK. You had all this before with this extreme high taxes for wealthy people. And was it such a great age in the 60s or the 70s? And there we must stop. Uh, Rainer Zeitelman, thank you. Thank you very much for talking to me. And I want to go back to you, Roland Atkinson, if you're still mm. there. Do you see in this type of analysis uh, that sheer envy is not really a very good basis for making new policy programmes? We've had a discussion there about the 1970s and envy. And these are two fundamental kind of tropes or, or ways of thinking about debates of inequality, which are frequently used to diffuse calls for greater fairness and tax justice. Let's start talking about the kind of destabilization that's actually going on in terms of broad social and economic conditions as a result of the kind of asset and opportunity hoarding at the absolute apex of the of the, the wealth pyramid here. And those kind of inequalities really translate into a much broader sense of injustice and anger, I would say, rather than envy. Roland Atkinson, thank you very much. Last words in this programme, I think, well, they simply must go to the 19th century French avant-garde novelist and art critic Octave Mirbeau. They are words which, well, to my mind at least, perfectly capture the, I don't know, the, the peculiar ambivalence, the, uh, what we could call the, the envy in spite of itself, which can characterise an encounter with a truly wealthy being. Mirbeau wrote... As soon as I find myself in the presence of a rich man, I cannot help looking upon him as an exceptional and beautiful being, as a sort of marvellous divinity. And in spite of myself, surmounting my will and my reason, I feel rising from the depths of my being towards this rich man, who's very often an imbecile and sometimes a murderer, something like an incense of admiration. Is it not stupid? And why? Why? That was a Thinking Aloud podcast from BBC Radio 4. You'll find a treasure trove of other Thinking Aloud programmes on BBC Sounds. A new podcast from BBC Radio 4. Children of the Stones. A village is the sort of place people get murdered in in old TV shows. A village surrounded by an ancient stone circle. The Stones are thirsty. A village with an impossible secret. The stones are changing people. I look me straight in the eye and I see what's there. Which is... Bliss. Subscribe to Children of the Stones on BBC Sounds. She's coming. Happy day.